So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, here we go. We are having a Pi YYC meetup joined with the Pi Data meetup today. So it's going to be a special night. And if you haven't done so, here at the bottom is the uh, Slack workspace, YYC Design Slack workspace. So if you haven't signed up, please sign in and uh, you can chat. And thank Timit for sponsoring tonight's event. So Timit is a recruiting team that um, makes your life much easier. So if you're looking for jobs, uh, whether it's active looking or you just want to learn what's going on in the job market, feel free to reach out to them. And here is a Pac-Man rule. So whenever standing as a group of people when socializing, always leave room for one person to join your group. This is really nice rule for socializing. So today's talk, as mentioned, we are going to have the Pi Data join us. So the first talk will be the Pi Data talk, building an intuition for probability. Um, the speaker is Ben, who is also the Pi Data organizer. The second talk is from Pi YYC, which is a highly performant I.O. The presenter is Peter. All right, the upcoming events. So um, the first one is Polyglot. A lot of the events are either postponed or canceled, and this one is postponed to be late summer. The specific date will be announced later. Hopefully it's not canceled. And the second one is probably DevCon Calgary, it's going to be September. And the last one is PyCon US. So PyCon US was actually, uh, if you uh, were in the previous meetups, you will see they actually, the original date was February, and then they canceled it. But now it's online. So you can check out all the talks and slides online, which is really nice. Here's the news. So the last Python 2.7 maintenance release was on April 2020, which was last month. And the last release for Python 2 was 2.7.18. So if you haven't migrated to Python 3, please do so immediately. The Python 3.9 beta 1 is available for testing, and 3.8.3 .3 is available right now. There is also a new version of the pip, which is 21. For Django, the 3.1 alpha 1 is available for testing, and the 3.0.6 is available, which is a bug fix. Here we go, the reading for the month. The first one is um, 10 things you need to know about the Django REST framework. So if you are backend with Django, then Django REST framework is very famous for developing the API-based uh, backend. Uh, this article talks about the tricks and the best practices about the view sets, serializers, and a few special custom methods, uh, how to deal with uh, less serializers and so on. So um, if you have some experience with Django REST framework, I would highly recommend to uh, read this article. The second one is very interesting. Uh, it provides three quick ways to compare data with Python. The first one is check data in, in its integrity, entirety. Um, oops, sorry. So um, there are basically two ways provided to check either with MD5 or SHA1. Uh, basically, these two algorithms are just like converting the entire documents into a hex string and compare whether they're the same. So it checks the document in its entirety. The second way is to check the contents with SQL. What it does is it dumps uh, the row of the data of the content into the SQL and check it. The third way is to check with pandas. There are a couple different ways to do it. So you can either use uh, .equals or .any or .equal. Uh, apparently, the last two methods are checking uh, are really good for like Excel's, so like table-ish. Uh, structure of data. So yeah, the last one is Python Language Summit 2020. It's actually a two-day lightning uh, talks at PyCon 2020. Um, it's online and it covers various topics, each about 30 minutes long. 
I have already posted the link in the um, in the slides. So uh, I'm gonna post the uh, slides link after you can check it out. Um, as usual, the last thing is that our Python meetup will be next month will be June 24th. And at the top, there are two links for the Alberta COVID and Canada COVID stats and info. Um, we're always looking for presenters. If like you have any ideas or any topics, you are more than welcome to join and um, any experience level is welcome. So, you know, at this very time, it's really nice to share what you know and what you uh, learned with others. If you would like to collaborate in any way, please just let our organizer community know. You can either Slack me or Slack Rich for more info and let us know whatever you need or want. All right, uh, let me give the party right to uh, Ben. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay. You're the host now, Ben, so it's all, all over to you. Nice. Let's see. Screen one. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Carson. Yeah, so as um as you guys know, I'm from Pi Data, which is another Python-oriented meetup group in the city. Carson and I connected um, a couple weeks ago to come together a little bit and see how we could host some more, um, you know, if there's content which is applicable to be shared between either, you know, both the data science, ML engineering communities, and the general development communities, how we could kind of come together and share knowledge, share information, create more opportunities for collaboration collision. So this is the first, the first meetup that, we've, that we're doing together. Thanks a lot to PyYYC, especially for hosting the, um, hosting the Zoom webinar and providing that information. So quickly to give you guys an update of what's happening in the data science community. So Data for Good has a virtual micro datathon tomorrow where they're going to be looking through some of the census data for Calgary. You can find that by Data for Good's um, meetup group and join there. So these have been pretty good. I definitely recommend them. Data for Good always does you know, great, great work. We also have the um, Calgary AI meetup. I think they've moved online. I think this one's Deloitte and Alta ML. Not sure, maybe that was last month. And then the Women in Data meetup has a upcoming event on June 18th for tracking mental health during the coronavirus pandemic, so. Sorry, that um, AI meetup was actually this month, but they're ahead of us, so. I think yeah, that's gotcha. already uh, finished. <laughs> yeah, this is this is the one for June 15th, which oh, I don't. Oh, so that's a new one, okay. Yeah, they must not have a a speaker set up yet. Cool. Um, also, we the 2020 YYC data conference is now open for abstracts and open to submitting abstracts for speakers. So this is a community driven, grassroots oriented data science conference in the city. We're having our inaugural, the inaugural conference is going to be in September. Uh, we're still monitoring the coronavirus situation and so that might wind up changing at which point we will likely reschedule as opposed to hosting the event online but anybody who's interested in either volunteering with the conference or speaking at the conference to present work that they've done either academically as a hobby or through their professional organization is welcome our website's yycdatacon.com i'll post the link in the uh, chat box after this and yeah so those are the main the couple big um you know the few announcements of upcoming events going on in the city on the data science side of things and so with that i'll get into um i will get into the presentation so this is going to be a fairly introductory well 
it's a very definitely an introductory session that we're going to be running here today and it's all about kind of like building up a intuition for probability so this is going to be applicable to anybody who's been you know interested in getting into machine learning engineering start to play with it interested in statistical models and how they work but maybe didn't go through this stuff in school or maybe they did and they don't and you don't remember or maybe it's just you want a refresher and to you know kind of reaffirm the knowledge that you already have so i'm going to try and keep it um fairly fairly short but i really encourage because this is intended to build an intuition and so that people really understand these concepts i'd really like to encourage people to if you have any questions at any point during the talk feel free to um feel free to send them and I'd like to address them kind of as, as everyone has them. I'll just ask Carson, maybe if you can, Carson and Rich, if you guys can monitor the chat and just interrupt me if there's a, if there's a question that comes up because I might sure. not. Awesome. Perfect. Yeah, I'll keep an eye on that, Ben. <clears throat> Perfect. So we're going to be going through a handful of topics. Um, the first one that we're going to start off with is going to be what is a stochastic What's a stochastic or a random variable and how does that differ from a deterministic variable? We're going to look at the you know, very common IID assumption in statistical models. What is independence and identically, identically distributed random variables? This is a core assumption in most statistical and ML models. We're then going to break down marginal joint and conditional probability and also see how they relate to each other. And for fun, at the end, we're going to use those relationships between those three probability concepts to derive Bayes' theorem, which, you know, um, the, this, work, this notebook and series is part of a larger series on uh, using Bayesian methods, Bayesian statistical methods in Python that PyData is running. And so this can be seen as kind of a, a prereq. So starting off with random variables. So the definition from Wikipedia, our trusty companion, is that, you know, in probability statistics, a random or stochastic variable is described informally as a variable whose values depend on the outcomes of a random phenomenon. Now, I like to think of it that it means really that even if you have all of the information about the variable, you can't know exactly what it's going to wind up being until after you measure it, right? Like there's, there's some element of uncertainty. That uncertainty could be the difference between, you know, the number being two and three, or it could even just be the number being two and 2.00001. But at its core, there is some intrinsically uncertain aspect of the variable, right? Can, you can uh, contrast that to get an, an idea. You can contrast calculating the result of, for example, 12 times 12 on a calculator, right? You're going to get 144 every single time, every time you hit that enter button, right? It's deterministic. Now, you could ask someone on the street what 12 times 12 is. Now, you still know what the answer should be, but you can't really guarantee ahead of time that that's what you're going to get, right? And you might even get a different answer if you ask the same person twice. They might think that it's funny to say, you know, 120 and one. So the simplest example of stochastic variables is rolling a dice, right? You know, you can get a number between one and six, probability of one over six for each. Um, and that's what a lot of introductory statistics textbooks will use, you know, drawing bags from a ball or rolling a dice or flipping a coin. But we're gonna have a little bit of fun with it and we're gonna dive into the quantum realm for this uh, just because it's more interesting. So as if you guys have ever had some nice sunglasses, you'll know that there's polarized filters on those sunglasses. And effectively what that does is it, polarized filters will ensure that only light of a certain orientation passes through. Now, it's not super important to know exactly what that means for those who haven't, um, haven't you know, their physics isn't up to snuff, but just know that you know, light can be in multiple orientations. And so by passing it through a polarizing filter, you make sure that everything is in the same direction. And then what you can do is if you pass the light through a second polarizing filter, you're going to have some probability that the photons are going 
to make it through. And that probability is a function of the angle between the polarizing filter and the light. So if we take a look at the image that's up on the screen, right, it passes through the first filter and everything has an orientation. All the light has an orientation of zero degrees, right? And then you go through a filter which is orientated 45 degrees to the, um, to the first filter, and there is an exactly 50% chance that the light will pass through. Now, the reason that we're using this for when discussing random variables is that the quantum world at its core is driven by probabilities, right? Like even if we know all the information, the exact orientation of the photon, you cannot ever guarantee whether or not it will pass through the filter. God is really playing dice and there's only a 50% chance that it's going to make it through. And so if you were to ask, if somebody's going to ask you, you know, will a photon with a polarization difference of 60 degrees make it through this filter? The best answer that you can give is probably not, but there's a 25% chance that it will pass through. And that probably not in that, in that phrase is the essence of a random variable, right? Um, they're not truly random as in we, it doesn't mean that we have no information about them. We are often able to make reasonable guesses about the, what the likely variables from a random variable will be. So for example, we have a pretty good idea that if uh, 100 photons pass through a filter with um, a 25% chance of making it through, about 25 and count how many we observe, we're probably going to get around 25. And so what we can do is of course we can simulate that. So whenever you're talking about a, um, something having a probability of occurring, like a 25% probability of occurring and counting the number of occurrences, that's uh, what the, that results in the binomial, the binomial distribution. And so that's what we're going to plot right here, right? So we can actually go through and we can see that, you know, how, here's the probability mass function for the binomial distribution where you're saying that we're going to observe n equals 100 photons and each individual photon has a 25% chance of making it through. And we can see the probability of observing, you know, these different numbers of photons. The most likely thing is that you'll see 25, but that's only got a 9% chance of occurring. Like, you could see 22 or 26 or 27. And all of those would be, you know, reasonable, plausible results. And in fact, if we, you know, run this, whoops. If we, you know, run this multiple times, we'll get a different answer every single time that we're measuring the number of photons that, that pass through. And so that's, this is what a random variable means, right? Like we've described the system, we've described the system as a binomial distribution and we're interested in observing the number of photons passing through. But even though we have all the information, we can only ever give you a probability of what's likely to happen. And so now, of course, oftentimes, whenever we're actually dealing with statistics, we usually have arrays or series of random variables. So we can just as easily, you know, use our binomial distribution, create random variables and pass in a size, right? And so for the most part, whenever we're talking about this, we're dealing with, you know, arrays of, of random variables. So does that, does that make sense? Everyone kind of feels that they understand random variables. It's a pretty simple one to start off on. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about sampling and distributions, right? So same thing, uh, I mentioned that we have our random variables are sampled from a, from a distribution, or we're using the binomial distribution which parameterizes what we're calling. So I'm just going to assume that everyone here is familiar with the, the normal distribution. Uh, it gets referenced quite a lot. This is, for example, if you were to, you know, measure the heights of various individuals, they're all going to fall in that classic bell-shaped 
up, that classic bell curve. So that's just one form of distributions. There's many other distributions that we'll go through later on in the series. But effectively, what we do is that we parameterize, which is to say that we describe the system that we're dealing with, right? And we parameterize, we parameterize the distribution, right? And then we sample variables from this distribution. So in the case of our, um, of our photons, you know, we can express what we're talking about symbolically as opposed to just using words. So here we have our random variable X, which represents the number of photons that we see passing through a filter. And we sample it from a binomial distribution, which is parameterized by N, the number of observations, in this case 100, and P, which is the probability of any given observation occurring. And we can use um, we can use the binomial theorem to calculate the probability that we see you know n photons pass through. So we can see that you know in this in this case we uh, we saw thirty photons pass through the filter, which had a four point six percent chance of occurring. So again, we sampled a random variable from our binomial distribution and then there's a probability that's associated associated with that and so now we're looking at you know a single you, you might think that okay Ben well I can calculate the probability of seeing a, any specific number using you know the binomial theorem that you've provided so doesn't it make sense then that I could plot the probability of seeing you know any number of photons pass through and the answer of course is yes um, so what we'll often see what you'll often hear referred to is going to be the probability mass function and the cumulative density function and so these are the basically descriptions of our um, of our distribution which tells us how likely some given event is so for the binomial distribution, we've got our, we've plotted the binomial, we've probably plotted the probability mass function here, which shows us the probability of observing any number of um, these events, right? And you can see, obviously, if you're looking at, you know, f observing 50 photons, well, it, you know, drops off to effectively a 0% chance, but not a completely 0% chance. There's still a probability. And then contrast that to, we have the cumulative distribution function. And the cumulative distribu distribution functions, again, pretty simple. It's just, if you were to sum up everything, if you sum up the probability mass function as you increase along the x-axis, that is what it gives you. So we see the probability of observing, you know, at least that many photons. So here we've, plotted it below where you see that okay we saw 30 photons um passed through the 30 photons passed through the filter it had a probability of five percent of seeing that many but if you wanted to know at, what's the probability that you saw at least 30 uh well that would be sorry at most 30 that would be about 90 percent and the probability that you would see more than 30 photons would just be you know the opposite of that so about 10 percent probability so we can use the pmf and cdf in order to quickly calculate what the range of possibilities what the range of possibilities are and these are always you know well-defined functions that you know here i'm using the scipy pretty sure i'm using scipy yeah using scipy to calculate those guys and we can just simply you know stats binomial distribution give me the probability mass function, I want this many samples with this N and P, and then, you know, plotting that. And we can do the same thing for the cumulative distribution, cumulative distribution function. So this is where we start to come into independent and identically distributed variables. So this is often uh, pretty much everyone is going to be familiar with linear regression. Linear regression also uses the IID assumption, which is independent and identically distributed. And the violation, most like every learning guarantee that 
I know of at least in the ML literature requires IID samples in order to provide a guarantee about like convergence, um, convergence in any boundaries on um, boundaries on the learning. And so, and that, that also applies to statistical, oh well, like ordinary least squares, linear regression, for, for those of you who aren't familiar with that term. Um, so it's important that we kind of understand what we mean by that. So first thing to understand is independence, right? And so two variables are independent if what happens to variable A does not impact variable B. The simplest example is always given as a coin flip, right? If I flip a coin and heads a lot and it lands on heads, well, it doesn't make landing on tails next time any more likely. You may have been at the roulette table and you've seen lost money on black 10 times in a row and you feel that it's overdue for a red, but you know the results of the roulette wheel are independent and what happens next is, um, doesn't matter what happened, what happened before. So I'm gonna use another uh, bit of a, more of a fun example. So, and this is to bring it out of the rules of casinos and games of chance, which are really well described by um, statistics and kind of apply it to something that might be a bit more intuitive for some of us. So we can consider that I've gone to a restaurant down on Stephen Ave for an early lunch, right? There's one other patron, patron and I don't know that person. Right. So I decide to order a burger. Right. And assuming that they're far enough away that they can't hear me and they don't see my burger come out. Well, if I decide to order a burger, it's not really going to impact their decision in any way. Those two events. Right. Like I order a burger and the other person orders a burger are independent. And so we've got this notation right here, which says the probability that the other person orders a burger given that I have ordered a burger is the same as the probability that the other person has ordered a burger. So this pipe that we see here denotes a condi like a conditional um, conditioning the probability on a different different variable. I guess it should have been burger underscore ben equals true. Um, so this just tells us that like what happens the value of you know, Ben getting a, ordering a burger doesn't change the probability of the other person, right? Now, you could imagine that my girlfriend is dining with me. And so she has a tendency to think more highly of a menu item, provided that I ordered it first. So in other words, she's a copycat, right? So if I order a burger, all of a sudden, it becomes more likely that she will order a burger than if she had than if I hadn't been there. So these two events, me ordering a burger and my girlfriend ordering a burger are not independent, right? Like the probability that she orders a burger given I ordered one is actually is actually greater, right? The occurrence of one event impacts the occurrence of another event. Another event. And so now we have uh, identity distributed. And identically distributed, I think this is the easiest to understand in, in an example. And so we'll go through, um, we'll go through a bit of a story that's going to help us to understand that. But what it means, what I, it identically distributed really means is that all of the variables, all of these random variables come from the same probability distribution. And that probability, the parameters of that distribution is constant across the, the sample. Uh, coming back up to our photon example right like if we're looking over here and we see that you know there's 50 percent chance of the photons passing through filter a right and we're building our models around that and then somebody comes in and they turn that filter so that it's no longer a 45 degree angle it's a 60 degree angle right well that's just changed the parameters of our distribution and any if we're measuring the photons our samples are no longer identically distributed. They're actually being sampled from two different distributions. And so any inferences that we were going to make have now been, have now been violated. So the, the, the example that we're gonna use for the, the remainder of this, this talk is that this is a, a, um, a study that was done in, economic, in 
the economic literature. I can't remember where, where I read it, but we were, you're designing an experiment to determine that if a, a server, a waiter or a waitress, if they draw a happy face on the bill, if it's going to increase the average tip size, right? So you get the bill back, there's a happy face, you feel happy, you think the server is nice, and so you increase your tip from 18% to 20%, right? And so as you're designing this experiment, you've denoted each table in the restaurant to be randomly selected uh, as to whether it's gonna be a happy face table or a control table, right? So far, so good, good design. Well, halfway through this experiment, um, your servers, you've got a very strange restaurant, and at some time, all of your servers change from female servers to male servers. And what's even worse is that your assistant failed to gather timestamps for the receipts, so you don't know the gender of the server, right? So we're trying to figure out whether or not drawing a happy face is going to increase the probability that you, or it's going to increase your average expected tip. But now we don't have, you know, just one controlled variable. We now have a second variable that's uh, uncontrolled, which or dependent variable, which is the gender of the server, right? And if we can imagine that if male servers and female servers receive tips of different sizes based on whether or not they drew that happy face, then maybe this, uh, maybe this experiment that we have might be ruined. And in fact, we violated the independently distributed variable assumption. So let's uh, set up a, let's go through and simulate this visually to kind of get a, get a better understanding, right? So we're going to have a hundred tables, which we sample from, and we're going to say that 45% of the servers are female. Right, so we set up, we get our counts. Now we're going to say that um, both female servers and male servers in the control case with no happy face being drawn on the receipt, both of them have an expected tip size that's parameterized by normal distribution. So they on average get a 17% tip and the standard deviation on that tip size is 4%, right? But now let's imagine that the, um, whenever a female server draws a happy face on the receipt, her expected tip size increases from 17% up to 20%. However, whenever a male server draws a happy face, they actually see the opposite result and that their expected tip size actually decreases from 17% to 60%. So we can go through and we can simulate some of this, right? So we say, okay, like we're going to draw, you know, random samples from, you know, these distributions which describe our system, male happy, female happy, male no happy, female no happy, and just shuffle them about, right? And then we want to plot what the, um, we're going to plot the tip size received by each of our servers in our simulation. And then we're going to perform the standard t-test that you hear about in all of the um, scientific literature. If any of you guys have heard of, you know, p-hacking and uh, all the kind of like the goings on with that, whenever you hear the term statistical significance, it's typically referring to, you know, this t-test that we're going to do. And so we're going to, you know, do that as well. And we're going to see, like, is there a statistically significant difference between the average tip size for the happy face or no happy face groups at the 5% level, right? And when we run that, we see that, oh, okay, like, actually, we, we reject, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. And we say that, you know, we're forced to say that it's likely or it's still possible that the, um, the average tip size remains the same after drawing the happy face on the receipt. But what would have happened if we actually hadn't messed up the, if the grad student hadn't messed up the labels and we actually had segregated the samples appropriately, right? Well, 
in this case, once we've separated the samples out properly, we actually find that actually, well, yes, there is a statistically significant difference between the average, between the average tip size. We just hadn't, you know, properly parameterized our data. And so what we, what we conclude is that, you know, if, uh, if our experimental design, if it doesn't hold, if the, the assumption of independent and identically distribu distributed samples doesn't hold, then the results of our statistical models don't hold, right? We thought that we were rejecting the, or that we failed to reject the null hypothesis in the first place, but once we properly conditioned the dependent variable, we found that actually, yes, there is a difference. And so, you know, this leads us into the discussion of marginal joint and conditional probability, right? I keep on saying that, yeah, we've conditioned on, conditioned on a variable, but what does that mean? So there's the three constituents. And so we're going to first start off with marginal probability because it's the simplest and it's also the one that confused me for the longest, despite the fact that it's simplest. And I think that's because it has a bad name. <laughs> um, and so, you know, grokking marginal conditional joint probability is critical if you're going to do any work in, you know, statistics, uh, engineering, etc. So the marginal probability, simply put, is the probability that an event is going to happen, right? Well, okay, if it's just the probability that something happens, why are we calling it marginal probability? Uh, its namesake is owed to, you used to have a table of probabilities where you'd observe the different events which occurred, right? And so before we had computers, what you'd wind up doing is you'd sum up all of these discrete events by rows or columns and then write the result in the result of that summation in the margins, which is why it's called marginal probability, right? And so we're going to take an example from Ben Lambert, who wrote Student's Guide to Bayesian Statistics, and we're going to simulate a, we're going to understand this by simulating some horse races, right? So you're interested in some hor two horses that come from a particular stable that you think produces winners, right? And you notice that these horses from the stable tend to do well or poorly at the same time, dependent on weather conditions. So what you do is you go to some races and you tabulate the wins and losses of Tom and Jerry, our two horses. And you note when both of them win, when neither wins, or when only one wins, right? So over here, we've got our table. We see Tom, you know, when Tom wins and Jerry wins, that occurs 25% of the time. If Tom loses and Jerry loses, that occurs 50% of the time. And then, you know, 10% of the time, Tom loses, Jerry wins. 15% of the time, Jerry loses, but Tom wins. So they tend to perform well or poorly together. So if you want to calculate, well, okay, that's nice, but what's the probability that Tom wins? Well, the probability that, or what's the probability that Jerry wins? To calculate the probability that Jerry wins, we sum up the um, sum up this win column of Jerry right and so we sum it up and we would write the result in the margin below the table the probability that Jerry wins is 35 percent probability that for example Tom loses we sum it up this Tom lose row and we get 60 percent so marginal probability is what's the probability that an event occurs it's called marginal because we used to tabulate the events and count up how many of them occurred and then sum them up and write the result in the margins. And so if we want to calculate the marginal probability that a guest in our example left a tip in excess of 20%, then we can go through and we count up all of the cases from the, you know, all the different cases, count them, divide them by, um, divide them by the total, and we find that in the simulation, there's a 26% chance that a guest, you know, lift a coat, lift, left a tip in excess of 20%. Okay, so what's conditional probability? Let's let's move on to the next step. 
So the conditional probability is, you know, if you know that event B has occurred, or sorry, the conditional probability is the probability that event B will occur given that we know that event A occurred. Um, I like to think of conditional probability as kind of gathering more information about the system, which helps us to further narrow down the exact situation we're dealing with. So if you're tasked with predicting the temperature outside on a random day next year, right? And I just say, hey, what's the temperature on some arbitrary day going to be? Well, you're not gonna have a very good idea, right? You're just gonna probably have to guess the average yearly temperature. But let's say now that I tell you that I'm asking you to predict the temperature in December. Well, ah, see, now you've got a bit more information and you're able to condition your estimate on the month of the year that I provided to you to, right? The temperature is still a random variable, right? You still can't know it. But now that I've given you some information about the month, you're able to condition your estimate on that. And like all things, it makes more sense in context. Right. So if we're going back to reviewing our simulation that we set up, we know that uh, if the if the gender was female and the happy face was condition is true, then the, the tip, the probability that they got a good tip is actually higher. Right. So if we condition on the gender variable, we're actually able to know that, OK, yes, we have a more likely chance of having gotten um, a good tip. So if we wanted to answer, um, if you wanted to get some answers from our data set, right? Like what's the probability that a female server got a tip greater than 20%? Um, what about if we consider only like, what's the probability that the female server got a tip greater than 20% in the cases when they used a happy face, right? Answering these questions um, a lot is basically the uh, essence of conditional probability. And we can understand that by, you know, doing a few examples, right? So we can start off say, okay, well, first we thing we do is we count the number of tips greater than 20% received across all the cases. Probability that they got a, so first question we would ask is, what's the probability that a server got a tip greater than 20% given that they are female? So we know that the server is female, so we only want to consider the female, uh, the female buckets that we've made. Remember, this is the female server with the happy face condition, female server, no happy face condition, male, happy face condition, male, no happy face condition. So we just count up the um, number of, we count up the number of people who got a tip greater than 20% in just these two buckets. And now let's say that we want to get the probability in conditions case two, right? So, well, actually, sorry, I'm going to go back here. So in this case, what we're answering is what's the probability that the tip was greater than 20% given that the server is female, right? Now, what's the probability that a server get, is got a tip greater than 20% given that they're female and that they drew a happy face on the receipt, right? So now we're conditioning on two variables and what we see is that we've just narrowed down the bucket which we're sampling from right in this first case we sampled from all of the female um female random variables but in this case we're only looking at the um the cases where the server was a female and they drew a happy face on the receipt i'm gonna skip number three whoops And so we can um, we can go through, and the results of our simulation are you know going to give us the answers to these to these questions. And so let's start to um, so what we wind up thinking after looking through these looking through these results is we say okay well. You know, I think the guests probably leave tips, which average around some value, which is driven by social norms, 17, 18%, and they're going to follow a normal distribution around that average, around those values, right? 
the normal distribution is typically a good assumption to use when you believe that there's a large number of interacting factors which all impact the value up or down, right? So if the tip size is a if the tip size that a guest leaves is a sum of a large number of effects, such as their disposition, their mood, the weather outside, whether their food was hot, the time of day, et cetera, et cetera, then we can typically model things as a normal distribution. So we come through and we say that, okay, the tips for the female cases are sampled, that's this tilde sign, sampled from a nor normal distribution parameterized by, you know, a mean, some given mean for the females and a given mean for the males. So what we want to do is we want to plot, um, see how good that, that model that we specified is at um, bifurcating the data. And so we see that whenever we condition, so we first start off with just looking at the distribution of tips received, you know, in general. Here we've got the mean and our, our distribution. And we see that whenever we condition this distribution on these two cases for female servers and male servers, we see that the data kind of breaks apart, right? This top, this top uh, distribution is the sum of these bottom two distributions. And you can imagine that if you're trying to, you know, if I give you a sample from the right hand side, um, you know, in this right hand bucket, and you're trying to say, okay, well, what's the probability that that person is going to be um, male, if they got a tip of say 25%, you know, you can look at come down here and say, okay, well, in this simulation, no male service got a tip greater than 25%. So it would have to be female. Right? So this is just, uh, yeah. So now we understand how what conditioning, um, conditioning on distribution means, which brings us to our final, our final stage in the probability, which is joint, joint probability. Uh, and I actually think joint probability is a bit simpler. Um, it's the probability both A occurring and B occurring, right? So seen visually, here we go. Venn diagram, we've got probability of event A, the server being female, probability of event B, them getting a tip greater than 20%, and in their intersection, P of A and B. And so we can, as we've done before, we can use our, um, we can, you know, compute that. Um, compute that what it is, and we're going to skip skip that. And instead, we're just going to go to a quick uh, a quick visualization. So, I think the joint probability distribution makes a lot of sense in terms of um, whenever we look at it look at it visually, right? So here we see um, we load up some data from the Federal Reserve of St. Louis, and we're looking at how the the jobless claims, so the new jobless claims. So whenever you lose your job, you file for unemployment, and that's counted as a new initial jobless claim, right? And so we have a hypothesis that you know whenever there's more initial jobless claims, whenever unemployment is increasing, then the GDP in the country is going to be lower. So what we're going to take a look at is the joint probability between jobless claims and future changes in GDP by, you know, two quarters, right? So we load up our data, we calculate the change in, um, calculate the change in GDP, lag it by a couple quarters, and take a look at the, take a look at the data. So this is say, if we're trying to answer a hypothesis of do jobless claims predict future changes in GDP? So we can plot these two side by side, nothing very interesting over there. But now if we plot them, um, we plot the joint probability distribution, um, we wind up seeing that, oh yeah, like there is, there is some type of relationship, right? Like maybe over here on the left-hand side, there's not a whole lot, it looks quite blobby, right? But we see that whenever jobless claims increase to a very large, a large number, you're almost certainly going to be in for, you know, bad times, rough times ahead, right? So there's more, the joint probability distribution gives you more information, um, more information about the system. 
And so we can think intuitively what that would mean, right? If somebody told you that jobless, initial jobless claims averaged 600,000 this quarter, what would you expect GDP to do? Well, that's pretty easy. You would just look at here, we have 600,000, however many, yeah, 600,000 initial weekly jobless claims. And you know, every time we've had that range, except for maybe a couple, GDP has decreased. So we'd be fairly confident in saying that, yeah, probably GDP is going to go down by, you know, maybe one or two percent. Now, this kind of sounds very similar to what we were talking about with marginal um, probability. And what we actually wind up finding is that, in fact, there's a relationship between marginal, conditional, and joint probability. So let's integrate kind of like what we've what we've learned and tie all of these together. So thus far, every time let's go back to our serving example, right? Thus far, every time we ask a particular question about the data, we simply calculated the number of cases that matched our particular use case, right? But let's uh, maybe we can think about this a little bit more, right? So if we wanted to calculate the probability that a server got a tip greater than 20% and that they were female, given that they were female, right? What we did is we looked at the use, the cases where, you know, the server was a female and wrote the, used a happy face and just divided by, um, and just divided out the total um, number of tips received by both the male and female servers. And so, but what we wonder is, what we wonder is, is it possible to calculate it without having access to the count data, right? So it doesn't matter if we had a hundred samples, right? If we, if we saw a hundred tables that were served or a thousand tables that were served, right? We've got the same proportion. So it seems like we should be able to say that, okay, well, if we know the probability, um, if we know the probability that they got a tip greater than 20%, and we know the probability that they got a tip greater than 20% given that they're female, like, shouldn't we be able to calculate the probability that they were given a tip and are female? And so, in fact, we actually can perform that relationship, and we do have a way to relate conditional, joint, and marginal marginal probability. So let's uh, think through it in terms of um, in terms of an example, right? So let's say that in this case, there's 10 servers at this restaurant. Five of them are men and five of them are women. And so we know that we know that um, three of those female servers got good tips, right? Good tip meaning greater than 20%. And so what's the probability that a female server got a good tip? Well, that's easy, three out of five, right? And um, what's the probability that they're female? Well, there's five female servers, five male servers, so it's 0 0.5. So if we convert that back to a proportion and we say that there's a, and we now ask what is the probability that a female server got a good tip, well, that's easy. It's three out of five. We know that because, you know, three out of 10, um, three out of the 10 servers are female, or three out of 10 servers got good tips, five out of 10 servers got, um, are female. And so dividing that out, we have 0 0.6. So if we, if we write out, what that means, right? We actually get wind up with a general multipl multiplicativity, multiplicativity, general multiplication rule of probability, which says that the marginal probability is equal to the joint probability divided by the uh, divided by the marginal probability, right? So the probability of A given B is equal to the probability of A and B divided by the probability of B, right? So if we're thinking about in terms of our story, the probability that somebody got a good tip 
given that they're a female server, is the probability that they got a good tip and that they were a female server. And then you just back out the probability that they're a female server, right? Like you can kind of think of it almost as like canceling, um, you kind of cancel out this server equals F and you replace it by conditioning on that, on that variable. And so we can, of course, write the code, which confirms, um, confirms that works, right? And if we use our little theorem that we wrote right up here, and we compare that to what we get, if we just actually count up the number of, um, we count up the conditional, or we calculate it by counting the conditional probability, we find that, of course, the numbers are the exact same. And this kind of brings us to the conclusion of our talk, which sets the, sets the foundation for Bayes' theorem. Right. So if we recall that we've got, you know, this equation above, right? So we've got P of A given B equals P of A and B divided by P of B. We can also write this the other way, right? P of B given A equals probability of B intersect A divided by probability of A. So to um, that would be saying that the probability that the server is female, given that they got a good tip is the proportion of servers who got a good tip and who are female divided by the proportion of servers who got a good tip. So the interesting thing to note though, is that the, the joint probability of A and B, uh, it doesn't matter which order, uh, doesn't matter which order the, um, we look at it, right? So the, essentially like the, uh, the probability that I'm a coder and I like sci-fi is equal to the probability that I like sci-fi and that I'm a coder. So what that means is if we kind of rearrange this formula, we bring this P of A over to the side, right? We can set these two equal to each other, right? P of A given B equals P of B, or P of A um, intersect B is equal to P intersect A. So what we wind up doing is we say that, okay, well, we set both of them equal to each other, and we refine that P of A given B times P of B is equal to P of B given A times P of A through this intersection, through the joint probability. Whenever we you know, remove this redundant equality and rearrange, then voila, we have derived the familiar Bayes theorem, which is you know, the basis of a large amount of statistics and applied mathematics. And so at the end, we can wind up going through and calculate, we can use the results of our simulation to confirm our intuition and confirm what we've derived um, via Bayes theorem, which in the interest of time, we won't talk about. So just to wrap things up and refresh everybody's memory on what we've learned. So to cast random variables, they're not truly random, but rather educated guests, right? Independent and identically distributed. Independence means that events don't impact each other. And identically distributed is that the distribution is constant and doesn't change over time, right? We learned about the probability mass function, probability density function, and the cumulative density function. And that's just looking at, okay, what's the probability that we draw some given value from a distribution? And then we found out, we learned about the marginal joint and conditional probability, right? Marginal probability is the probability that a given event occurs. The joint probability was the probability that two or more events occur at the same time. And conditional probability is the probability that event B occurs knowing that event A also occurred. And finally, we combined our knowledge of marginal joint and conditional probability in order to derive Bayes' theorem through the general multiplication rule of probability. And so, congrats, congrats all. Um, you now have a solid foundation of some of the basic probability concepts that you can apply in, in your work going forward. And so I've got the, um, before, I hand it, before I hand it over, um, I will post the link. So I've got this whole thing in a notebook blog post form that has a lot of words that I just didn't want to put up 
on the screen. And so I'll make that, um, I'll make that available to everyone after, after the presentation. And so if there's uh, any questions, feel free to ask them. Otherwise, I'll uh, turn it over. Yeah, if everyone sees the chat box, if you have any questions for Ben, just uh, drop them in there and uh, I can read them out if Ben's doing it. Well, I guess you're done your presentation now, but uh, you can see the questions, hey, Ben, if they come in. Yeah, I'm trying to find where they... I'm not... Oh, um, okay. I was just asking... No, okay, so that's good. So I'll, I'll just keep okay. an eye out for questions, Ben, and then I'll, yeah. I'll keep back to you. But right now I'm going to just hand it over to Peter here. So I'm just going to move it over. And um, well, that was great. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah, looks thanks, like there is a awesome question time. there for you, Ben. Oh. <laughs> yep. oh, here it is. Yeah. <laughs> B of B given A occurred, can they happen at the same time? Um, where is this? So there's a chat box. I know Zoom's kind of gone uh, wonky, rearranging everything. Um, I'll just read it to you again, Ben, if that's helpful. Yeah. I know it's hard to take the question yeah. uh, versus reading it, but it says P of B given A occurred, can they happen at the same time? P of B given A occurred, can they happen at the same time? Yeah, yeah, so they could. So you can think about, um, if you, as an example, you could, consider that both of those events were caused by a covariant, right? So I'm going to go back to the old school debate with smoking, right? So now we know that smoking causes lung cancer, right? But back in the day, people weren't sure about that. And there's a lot of debate and a lot of like statistical literature that we have now owes its, you know, roots kind of to those, to those days. And so what people used to propose was that, you know, maybe there was a genetic predisposition which caused somebody to be both more likely to smoke and more likely to develop lung cancer, right? So in this case, your probability that you smoke or the probability that you, um, the probability that you have lung cancer given that you smoke is determined through some mediator variable, which is your genetic disposition. Right. And so you can have it to where this is where we have like correlation does not necessarily equal causation. Right. So even does that does that make sense? Uh, Brian just typed in another bit. Uh, Brian, just type here if that uh, we can't uh, turn uh, chatting on to all the panelists, but uh, if that's good for you, Brian, just drop it in. And then Brian added can B happen before A and then uh, given A quotation marks. Yeah, I mean, you could you could calculate it definitely. Um, whether or not that gives you, um, well, no, yeah, that would give you that gives you information. So another another example is like this would be something where you would use Bayes theorem. Uh, Bayes theorem can actually help us quite a bit, right? So let's go to an example of I'm using um, I am wearing a toque because it's snowing, right? So if the weather in Calgary is bad and it's snowing outside right so let's say that in general i wear a toque you know one fifth of the time and but whenever it's snowing i wear a toque three quarters of the time and we also know that it snows about one in every three days in the winter in calgary right so normally whenever we're asking questions right like it's easy for us to think about the probability going forward right like okay like when it's snowing what's the probability that i'm going to wear a two, right? We're thinking forward in time in this case. And that's, and that's simple, right? I told you it's one out of three times I'm wearing a two when it's snowing. But now let's say that you're stuck in a, um, you are a university student and you slept in the dorm campus. And so you haven't seen the outside. And so you don't know whether or not it's snowing. And I come in and I'm wearing a toque, right? So now you're going to say, what's the probability that it's snowing outside, given that I'm wearing a toque, right? So that they, they, it was snowing first, and then I wore a toque, but there's still interesting information that you can gather. And it's that thinking backwards in time uh, that humans are often bad at. It's not as intuitive of a, it's not as intuitive of a calculation. And that's actually where we can use Bayes theorem 
and um, you know, going through this general multiplication rule that we demonstrated to help us like, you know, we can actually calculate the probability that it's snowing outside given that I'm wearing toque. Perfect. Okay. Oh, am I on mute? No, I took mute off. I used to, I talk so often I realize I'm on mute halfway through. So I don't see I don't see any other questions uh, coming through. But if you do uh, if you do think of them, uh, drop them in and we'll circle back at the end. But for now, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Peter here. So um, thanks so much, Ben. That was great. And then uh, Peter, you're the you're the host now, so you'll have the uh, screen sharing. Okay. Uh, sorry. To interrupt, uh, one second before that. So basically, just want to advertise this uh, Python draw again. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, if you haven't done so and would like to participate in the Python draw, please uh, click on the link I just sent out to the chat panel and put your name there. So we don't have a lot of participants right now, so there is a high chance to win a license for a year. So, hooray. <laughs> All right, yeah, I'm done. It's your turn, <laughs> Peter. Okay, um, I guess the question I had was whether people wanted to take a little break or not first, but I guess, uh, I don't know, what's the standard protocol here? <laughs> we can always take a break part way through, I guess. Um, is my the presentation showing through? Yeah, I can see it, Peter. It looks good. Okay, let me just set one other thing up. So tonight's talk is, at least that I'm giving, is highly performant I.O. Um, and really the goal here is to, well, just I'll start fairly simple and don't worry about that. It'll pick up. Um, and then the idea is we'll just sort of cover a couple of typical design patterns. I'll give you some Python code to implement them. Um, I do some benchmarking and we can sort of look at the results at the end of things. So just to make sure everybody's on the same page, what is the I, what is the O? <laughs> I is input, O is output, and IO together usually means either an input and an output or an input or an output operation. Um, lots of different flavors of operations, so we just sort of make them nice and generic, and usually they involve passing data around. Now, the title of this presentation is Highly Performant I.O., and why would you sort of want to bother to sit through it? And I hope the, in the end I can give you sort of a different perspective on I.O. and some of the common patterns for at least doing socket-based I.O. So this would be I.O. going between computers. Um, and when we talk about I.O., most people are either sort of thinking about communication to and from, say, a, a hard disk or web servers. So, you know, in other words, things that sort of toil in the dark, giving us information. Um, however, there's obviously more than those cases that we need to consider. Um, However, since it's really about Python, we're just, I'm just going to keep this to the application level and, like I said, mostly to do with sockets. Um, but ultimately, the big thing I want you to take away from this whole presentation is that I.O. is about waiting. And waiting. And waiting. So, a computer. Um, so, really, a computer is just about transforming things and they didn't call it a transformer only because those things already existed and they didn't want to make it more confusing. Um, anyway, just for a very, very quick overview, the thing in the middle of this, uh, or you know, sort of at the intersection of the T, um, is the processor and that's the brain. Um, it has a bunch of blocks below it that help it remember what it is it's supposed to do. So those will contain instructions and storage and all that sort of thing for output and input. Uh, and they're generally located in the same container. Um, you have a bunch of stuff for inputs on the left and a bunch of stuff for outputs on the right. Um, these things are generally physically separated. And again, as I said, I'm gonna be concerned more with input coming from a network and going out to a network. Um, 
So when I say IO is really all about waiting, what do I actually mean? So let's just sort of take a theoretical processor. We don't care really what it is. And let's just say it operates at four gigahertz and that's its cycle. So it's in its cycle time of 0.25 nanoseconds, it's able to compute something. So something simple, maybe just an addition or something like that. So, you know, each, each operation is happening in a quarter of a billionth of a second. Um, it's not gonna be able to do incredibly complex things within that time, but it's pretty darn fast once it gets going. And, you know, this type of processor is not necessarily uh, totally unreasonable. It's probably what a lot of your, you guys are running code on. Um, and so because these numbers are so small, let's just sort of scale it up. So let's pretend a cycle time is one second uh, to do this fast operation. And then let's, let's look at uh, how other things compare. And the reason I chose one second is probably that's about how fast most of us are before we've had coffee in the morning. So a, a typical input output operation that a processor is going to do is getting data from its RAM, so random access memory. And so in modern RAM, it, let's take something around 15 nanoseconds. Um, so if we scale that up to uh, what we used before, we're dealing with about 60 seconds to access some main memory. Um, if we go up from there and we start to say, maybe have to get information from a solid state disk, we'd be looking something on the order of 50 to 150 microseconds, which when we scale up, we are dealing with fairly large time frames already. We're dealing with two to six days maybe. Um, if you've had to sit around waiting for your computer to boot up off of a spinning hard drive, well, the equivalent there might be something 45 days up to say 1.2 years. Um, and it really gives you an idea of how patient that poor processor is. Uh, moving more on to the network side of things, if we look at a ping, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, ping is sort of a protocol that operates with two messages between computers. So there will be a ping to a remote computer and the remote computer pongs back to say, I got your message. So that time for a message to go from Toronto to Montreal, Montreal back to Toronto, we'd be dealing with, we talk about something like 10 milliseconds. So that's for a processor, that would be the equivalent of sort of 1.2 years. Um, and you know, going up from there, Los Angeles, 70 milliseconds. If you're going down to say Johannesburg, it's the equivalent of 30 years. So thank goodness processors don't have artificial intelligence because they all rise up out of boredom and get us all. Um, with a typical program, you're going to generally classify it crudely in one way or another. You're gonna say it's either sort of a processor bound, uh, program or it's an IO bound. And the idea is to sort of imply something like weather simulations, which doing an awful lot of numerical calculations, um, those are gonna be on the processor bound side. Something like a web server, which is taking a whole lot of network input, giving you a whole lot of network output, that's something that's going to be more on the IO bound side of things. And the reality is most applications are probably sitting on the middle of things. Um, but one thing I'd like you to think about is the fact that most processor bound uh, applications, they're actually IO bound, but the IO bound is really, we're talking about the input output operations in between the processor, first levels of cache and RAM. Um, and that's why often rearranging instructions or rearranging the order that you access data can vastly improve your processor bound things. You're simply changing how you're accessing your data. And then usually when you're building an application, you really care about three things. Primarily, you probably care about your correctness. If it doesn't do what you want, it's a defect of some sort. Um, you probably also, in some cases, concerned about how long it takes to run, but maybe you're not. Oh, have we got questions going on there? I can't really see the questions. <laughs> yeah. 
if somebody wants to speak up, um, Rich or whoever, one of the panelists, yep. just let me know well, if there are I questions. This previous, um, uh, previous question, uh, previous sessions being uh, recorded. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, uh, those are they're just asking about the previous meetups, I guess. So um, we haven't decided where to post that yet, but yes, the um, April one was recorded. So does this one, and we will post it out somewhere later. I will send out the email to everyone, so please uh, keep an eye on the email. Okay, thanks for that. Um, secondly, you probably care about complexity, and here I'm not talking about big O notation, really just more how hard is it going to be to implement this thing? How hard is it going to be to maintain it? Because ultimately, software has to exist for some period of time, might have several generations of developers that are um, dealing with it. And then if you care about efficiency, it's probably sort of third on the list. Um, and so usually speeding things up are, is really the first thing that you care about. Um, and the way to do that ultimately, once you've sort of optimized your input output down at the processor cache RAM level, looked at your instructions and your algorithm, uh, parallel instructions. So parallel instructions are just two things running at the same time. And I'll just state the obviously, you, you have to have separate hardware to actually do that, be it separate processors, separate channels, whatever it might be. Um, and then efficiency, if you want to think about it the way most disciplines do, uh, although don't talk to an economist, not the bank type, but the you know, ivory tower type of economist, what efficiency is, and you'll get an entirely different answer. But for most disciplines, it's really how much can you make for a unit of effort, okay? And so when we're thinking about IO operations, it's really about, you know, the numerator is probably something like input output operations, and the denominator, how much effort does it, uh, does it take is probably something like how many seconds, how much processor time, something along those lines, uh, number of servers. Um, and so it's always gonna depend on the particular thing. Maybe you're ultimately thinking, you know, more along the lines of ARM and you're looking at say thermal envelope power usage. How old a machine can we put it on? How cheap of an AWS EC2 <laughs> uh, instance can we use? Um, lots of different ways to think about it, but efficiency ultimately often figures into things. And so in the quest for efficiency, if you think back to early, you know, or well, as I mentioned, you know, there's an awful lot of waiting going on in the processor, especially when you're doing input output operations from the network level. And so what's a developer to do to sort of keep efficiency in mind? Well, you know, looking back in history, perhaps down to the back to the dawn of early computers, they said, oh, why don't we start allowing multiple people to start using the same device? Um, and so in a situation like that, you have concurrency. Now, concurrency is different from parallelism in that concurrency means people are using, or two things are, or multiple things are using the same hardware. There's just an illusion that there's parallelism going on. So say task one does something, task two does something, back to task one, and so on. Um, when you start putting people into this, obviously you have issues in that you have to worry about uh, one task hogging everything and not letting hot task two come in. And this is where you get into cooperative multitasking versus preemptive multitasking. And there were lots of solutions that came along for that. Address space isolation, so processes uh, came along. Um, and like I said, preemptive multitasking where an operating system can just say, no, you've had enough time. You only get so much and you're over. Anyways, enough of this bull. Let's just uh, sort of move on and talk a little bit more about some uh, input operation, input output idioms uh, and approaches. So today I'm really going to talk about three different models, synchronous blocking, synchronous non-blocking, and asynchronous. So synchronous programming refers, as you can probably imagine, um, refers to actions that are connected with a thread of execution. What you see is what you get. 
um, A, then B, then C, then D. There's generally not supposed to be anything that's happening behind the scenes that doesn't make any sense. Um, now with synchronous, uh, we have two flavors. We have blocking and non-blocking, and this is referring to the calls down to the operating system. With a blocking call, say you were doing something like a read, and you said to the operating system, I'm reading off this socket, and it's going to say back to you, okay, I'll let you know when you, there is something to actually read. And your program will be halted, and the operating system will do whatever it wants to do. At some point later on, it will come and wake you back up and say, oh, here's some data for you. Now, with non-blocking, the program is then saying to it, oh, I don't want to ever block. So when I'm trying to do a read, if there's nothing, you let me know. And so the, operate, the operating system will let you know something like an E would block is usually an error type. Um, and it will return immediately, letting you know there's an error. Otherwise, it will return you some data if there happens to be something. Asynchronous program is a method of providing cooperative multitasking. As the word asynchronous indicates, the threads of execution are in some way detached from what you see. There's something going on, or could be something going on in the background. And when we add the word programming into that, so asynchronous programming sort of indicates that there's some kind of software support to get a bunch of different threads of execution within a seemingly synchronous thread. So uh, I'm just going to walk through a bit of synchronous boiler, synchronous blocking boilerplate code here. So uh, this is Python. So you're probably going to be using, you're going to be importing socket and threading. Um, the first thing you're going to do is create a socket. Um, and in this particular case, I'm just simply saying reuse the address just in case the previous run hadn't closed down quite quickly enough. We're going to bind to a port, which means we're going to now associate this socket with 0000. zero, zero, zero. Um, so in other words, this particular machine that it's running on with a particular port. And then we're going to listen. And so this is how most of <laughs> these examples are going to be set up in one way or another. Uh, Peter, we just have a question coming yep. in here. Certainly. Um, just says, how, if at all, does the GIL affect these paradigms in Python? Um, so with everything I'm going to talk about this evening, I mean, the GIL, as we know, uh, operates on a process level. So you can only have one thread of concurrent execution or of execution at any given time. So anytime you're going to see anything, um, it's really you're getting concurrency is what I'm going to be dealing with. Um, if you are interested in actually trying to defeat the, G the GIL, um, you're going to have to start uh, operating in multiple processes. But the concepts are kind of the same, and so you can just sort of extrapolate from there. But yes, the the, it does it does uh, come into effect, and you'll notice it mostly with uh, with threading examples, um, where I sort of scale up this synchronous blocking. So hopefully that answers it, and I'll just sort of move on. Um, so synchronous blocking is probably the the approach that most people are familiar with. Uh, it's taught in school. It's nice and obvious it's synchronous so it's a b c d um, and when you see a read it's waiting until there is actually something um, and i'm just going to be using a, a notation here that's called a, a message sequence chart or a message sequence diagram and really what you have are these vertical lines with the little name bubbles on these are um, the the, the vertical lines represent the actors. So we, in this particular example, we have a program actor and OS, an operating system actor. Time flows from the top down to the bottom. So our program is fairly simple. Um, here's that boilerplate at the beginning. And then we just sit in a loop and we ask the socket to accept incoming connections. So those Incoming connections, because this is blocking, our code will stop right there, waiting for something to come in. When something does come in, our con uh, variable will be uh, filled up, and we will invoke 
we will ask it to read, so receive off of that connection. In this particular case, we're asking it to receive up to 1,024 bytes, but it could come back with less. It could come back with zero, for instance, if the connection is closed. So the OS goes off and it says, oh, well, I don't actually have anything right now. And so it goes and maybe it checks the hardware. Um, and it puts the program to sleep. At some point later on, there's a message that comes back from the hardware and says, oh, yeah, actually, I've got something here. And it's at that point that data, actually, the L value is actually populated and we actually have continuation going on for program. We can then continue to read and read and read. Again, each of these receives may well block. And then when we're done, we'll close the connection. Um, but again, the important thing to realize here is that sock.accept and con.receive are blocking operations. So here's just a little example. Um, with uh, the link I sent out earlier today um, in the GitHub repository, I provided a bunch of test programs. So here we've got just two clients attempting to do something interactive with it, but because this is blocking and single threaded, the second one can't do anything until the second connection is closed. That's when it's actually accepted by the actual program. So just very simple and straightforward. Okay, so the question is how, okay, so performance in this particular case is bounded by how quickly an individual client can actually give information to the part that's receiving. Um, but there's generally very little CPU time required to receive or send a message, partially because of those delays that we're talking about, but also because of the, just the difference in time frame between how a processor operates on the scale versus, you know, bit transmissions. Um, so it's pretty hard to saturate a connection. And so what's a poor efficiency minded programmer to do? And so the usual solution is add in multiple threads of execution. Now I'm not talking parallelism here because as we were talking about earlier, um, when you're operating a thread, it's generally operating in the same address space, which means you're going to be uh, constrained by the global interpreter lock. So we really don't have to make a particularly large change uh, to the program to make it scale up to multiple clients. Um, the change we make is we make one thread is a listener, which is what we had before. But as soon as the listener has something come in, has a connection established, it passes it off to a new worker thread. And so on, and so on, and so on. And so you do that, and then you can start to get an example like this. One client is connected in, second client is now connected in. It's able to operate at the same time. One quits, and the other one quits. Okay, so let's just sort of walk through the code a little bit here. Okay, so what you have, we, I showed before, you basically got a loop and you accept a client or accept a connection, you read off of it and block until it's finished and then you close the connection. The reading blocking as we went through in this particular case, you're just receiving up to 124 bytes and you're just gonna keep looping until the client closes the connection. If we want to change this to the multi-synchronous or the multi-client synchronous blocking, we're basically looking at the same kind of thing. We're sitting in a lock or we're sitting in a loop. The main thread is waiting to accept any new incoming connections. As soon as a new uh, connection comes in, it creates a thread and it starts it given the value of the connection. So in other words, the connection is passed off to this new thread. And then 
the new thread goes ahead and this run part is essentially the, the running of the thread. So as soon as the thread starts up, run is executed and we it just basically does a, re, a walking read, waits until the client has closed the connection and then it closes down the actual connection from its side. So it's fairly easy to scale. What's the big deal? Well, naturally everything comes with some trade-offs. Um, so what are some of the problems that come with this sort of solution? Threads are generally operating level first class citizens. So there shouldn't really be too much of a problem. You know, we had to do a little bit of a rewrite for the code to accommodate these multiple threads. That's not too bad. We have to shuttle information, you know, data and file descriptors back and forth between the threads. You know, generally this isn't a big deal because everything operates in the same process memory space. Uh, but we do need to worry about race conditions that start to happen when information is shared in any which way between the different threads. It's, it can be complex to get right in all but the most straightforward situations. Um, perhaps the biggest concern would be memory usage because each thread requires an execution stack. Uh, and, you know, by default, I think it's a megabyte for Linux and uh, Windows. And so it can be quite expensive in the worst case kind of scenarios where you have thousands of connections and hence threads um, and you're attempting to saturate a big fat network link. Now, one thing I will point out is this memory usage from the stack is theoretical because it's virtual memory, but depending on how you know complex your code is, you may end up yeah, using a fair chunk of that. Um, if you were concerned about virtual memory size, you could use something like green threads, which are uh, system or um, user space threads, sometimes M to N threads that they talk about. Um, and so they're not first class operating system citizens. I don't think you generally need to worry about that too much. But if you are interested, um, you can have a look at greenlets. Um, okay, so. We've talked about blocking, let's move on to non-blocking. Um, and so what you have in the non-blocking case is you have a program that's running and it's going to do a receive. The operating system is going to confirm with the hardware, hey, is there anything here? And it's going to return if it hasn't got anything at all. And it's gonna say, hey, there is an error I can't give you anything um, because I'd have to wait for something. In other words, E would block. So error, the call would block. So at that point, your program has to just decide what's it gonna do. Is it gonna sleep for a bit or whatever? Um, there are also some other error conditions that can come in and it gets a little complex to handle them all, but it's certainly doable. Um, so our program makes another call. Nope, still nothing. Oh, and then all of a sudden the operating system gets something back and the program tries the next time and it says, oh yeah, there is something. Great. Um, so we can have a look at the message and if it happens to be a length zero, it's the, the, that means that uh, the connection is closed. Otherwise we've got a message and we get to do something. So our code will or operate something like this. Nothing to read, nothing to read, nothing to read. Oh, I got something. So in this particular case, I've just put a one second delay in, otherwise it would <laughs> spin far faster than you'd like. And in this case, it's just set up so it's only handling one thing at a time. Okay, now how do we scale synchronous non-blocking up to handle multiple clients? Well, interestingly enough, we have to uh, use a blocking call <laughs> to implement non-blocking efficiently. Um, so we use something called either an operating system call, either select or poll are the general ones. There are some variants, e-poll, k-poll, all sorts of things like that. Um, but the general idea is with each of these, you can provide them a long list of things to listen to. And when any of them have something for you, the call will return. 
So in the case you make a select or a pull call, something comes, some information comes back from the hardware and control will be returned to your program at that point in time. You then have to look at it and you have to go through your structure, however it does select and pull, do it slightly different, but the idea is you're gonna get a giant table of them in some which way and you need to figure out oh is it you know connection number 7902 or number seven or is it a new incoming connection or something like that and so in this particular case if you figure out it's a new connection we're going to accept it in a non-blocking way otherwise we're going to service the connection in some way so let's just assume it's servicing we try to figure out whether it's a read or not it's a read, so we do the read, and then we're just gonna look at our data. And if we've gotten everything, then we're just gonna close everything down. And so that's the idea with it. And as you would expect, when, you're, when you've scaled it up to multiple users, you're gonna be able to have multiple things going on at the same time. Now I've just returned a whole bunch of gross information. You don't really have to look at the big long string, but that's what's coming back from uh, select in this particular case. So the important thing to see there is it waits on select forever. So it's blocking until the operating system tells them tells the program thread of execution that there's something going on. So this is what your boilerplate for the non-blocking is going to look like. Sockets, importing selectors, types, Erno, bunch of stuff. We just have a message. Um, I guess the syntax kind of got, or the characters kind of got changed around for the syntax when I copied it in. Uh, we've just got a message that buffer that we're gonna leave equal to nothing. Um, and we've basically got the same thing. We're gonna to bind to a port, local port 8888 on our machine, and we're gonna listen. So let's just walk through the code for the single, uh, the synchronous non-blocking case. So for every time through the loop, it's just going to sleep, as I mentioned. This is why it was printing out the nothing to read, nothing to read, and so on. It then goes through and receives non-blocking, and we sort of talked through this one already. It's going to it's going to make a, a request to receive some data. It might be blocking. If it's blocking, it's going to print out nothing to read, and then it's going to go back out in the loop and sleep for another second. Otherwise, it's going to attempt to process the error. Now, in the multi-user case, the sock is the part that's accepting the incoming connections, we need to now set it to non-blocking. And we're going to set up our selectors that are getting passed into or used for the select call. When we're first doing everything, obviously there is only the one socket that's going to accept the incoming connections. And so we wait on it. At some point later, something is going to happen. The operating system is gonna wake up the thread of execution and we're gonna get the choice to either accept it or, uh, or service it. So moving on from a synchronous programming approach, um, just wanted to talk about a couple of famous asynchronous software approaches. Um, the first one that people may have heard of is Node.js, and this is for running JavaScript not on a browser. And the idea is there you have multiple bits of execution that are happening as soon as one input or output processing bit goes to sleep something else comes in and starts running if there is something to run and nginx is a web server load balancer reverse proxy whatever you want to call it um, it is it was it sort of came along and uh, dethroned apache as sort of the de facto typical best uh, web server quite a while ago and it does it like apache sets it up where it run what used to run with a bunch of worker processes but it changed it to a bunch of worker threads um, and so that was sort of the synchronous blocking approach that we talked about nginx came in and it said okay we're going to treat this very much like a, a an http request like a state machine and in that state machine there are various places where we can pause. Um, 
And when we're paused, because we're waiting for something, we can process something else. So it does pretty much everything within one process. So there's none of this uh, having to worry about spawning out new threads or the big memory issues that you can have if you have lots of processes that are working. Um, and the big thing with these two things is it's really thinking about IO as a state machine that really sort of helps you understand the asynchronous. And so <clears throat> this is conceptually what's going on and it's not exact, but don't worry about it. Um, you have a couple of tasks, a bunch could be N, we'll just do it with two. And we're gonna, these things are going to be running a sequence of coroutines. And so coroutines are, I'll talk about it a bit more later, but they're things that can be little units of operation, tasks, chunks of information, or some people think, think of them as functions that can be suspended and then resumed. We have an event loop, which is an executor that can decide which of these coroutines can be running at a given time. So task one does a bunch of stuff and then blocks waiting for the outcome of some coroutine. So the coroutine is saying, oh, okay, operating system, what's going on? Oh, uh, have to wait for some stuff. Okay. So the, when the operating system says it has to block, well, control may return back to the, the event loop. It all depends how, how that's going to be implemented. But essentially think about it as the asynchronous stuff, the part on the, the left-hand side, is going to be paused until the operating system comes back and it says, hey, threads, I've got something for you. You figure out where it goes to. Uh, the event thread kind of like an operate, uh, like a user space scheduler is going to figure out where this is destined for. Let's say it's going to task two and then task two gets yielded to um, and the coroutine that it was expecting resumes back and it starts executing. So what's a coroutine? Um, this is just the definition from Wikipedia. Um, so coroutines are computer program components that generalize subroutines for non-preemptive multitasking uh, by allowing execution to be suspended and resumed. And that's really the big thing, is it can be stopped at a known, obvious place, and then it can be resumed later. So this is why it sort of works nicely for I.O. operations. It's very similar to the blocking synchronous approach that we saw. It gets suspended when it would be blocking, and then it resumes when the answer to whatever the blocking thing um, is resolved. And just a quick reminder of what a finite state machine is, since I sort of mentioned it earlier. Um, it's, you can think of the operational states of a program uh, being encapsulated in some kind of a relational diagram. Uh, this particular diagram is from Wikipedia and it's for a turnstile. Uh, you know, so one of those things that spins and either lets you through or doesn't, depending on something. So a program is always in one state. In this case, the states are represented by the circles, and we have locked state or an unlocked state. So you can imagine a locked state means nothing goes through the turnstile, an unlocked state means um, something can pass through the turnstile. Okay, and a program transitions from one state to another state based on input or an event. So if it's locked, somebody tries to push on it, it stays locked. If it's locked, somebody puts a coin in, it goes to unlock and so on. Um, <clears throat> and you can think of these quite easily as the events. So in other words, the arrows can be really thought of as coroutines. So we have a push coroutine, and then it's sort of wait, it makes a transition, and then it's waiting for some more input. So there's three typical approaches to uh, asynchronous programming that you'll see most of the time. I mean, there's some others, but um, this is sort of the general, these are sort of the general idioms. So you have callback based things, and this is fairly simple. When execution is resumed, it goes, it returns to some function that was passed into whatever the coroutine, the suspended bit is. The second one, um, promises or futures, which are both fairly similar in concept, um, 
Uh, I prefer future, frankly, but uh, you know you can use either. Um, but a future is basically an entity that will resolve to a solution at some point in the future, um, outside the thread of execution. So you can't say when it's going to resolve, but it's going to resolve at some point. And so that sort of suspiciously sounds like I'm waiting for an IO, a, a response back. Let me know when it happens. Um, Python got future support in 3.5. And then the third way is using these sort of first level or, or um, keywords uh, of async and await. And these exist in a whole bunch of languages as do the other ones. Um, but uh, they are first class language features and the await keyword basically formalizes the idea that you're telling the software when I'm calling this method, which is going to be a coroutine, I will block and I expect to block to wait for response. So you can go ahead and run something else in the meantime, which is exactly cooperative multitasking. Um, it's exactly like the synchronous blocking example, except we're making it very explicit what's going on here. Um, and async and await actually started out in C sharp from my understanding. And it also got support in 3.5, mostly because async and await use features. Okay, so just an example of callback. This one happens to be written in JavaScript, but you should be able to follow along fairly easily. In this particular example, we're calling the file system FS uh, package, and we're asking it to do a read dir. So in other words, get the direct or the contents of a directory. Source just happens to be the directory that we want, the location, in other words. Um, and then we're also passing in a function pointer. Um, JavaScript happens to do closures, so they tend to do it like this. But you're basically passing in a function that will be invoked by convention, um, there's nothing special. There's no first class, um, uh, there, there, there's nothing special about this from a language perspective. It is really just a, an agreement between the library and the program. Um, and so this callback will be invoked whenever the answer is available. And so, one thing people sometimes talk about this callback is callback hell where you know it, it it's understandable but it just slowly marches to the right as you get more and more complicated state machines so you know this does this this and this and this and this and it it just keeps moving it all the way over to the right um and that's really usually the complaints that people have. This particular example just happens to be from a website called Callback Hell. Um, as I mentioned, futures came in in Python 3.5, and under the hood, that's what's used for async and await. Um, you could spend a whole talk about those, and I'm just not going to worry about it. Just remember, they're an abstraction, and you know. We won't worry about them. I'll just sort of keep going on and focus more on async and await. Okay, so let's just uh, walk through some of the boilerplate that's going to be in these things. The functionality uh, in Python comes from a library called async.io. And as I mentioned, there's a concept of an event loop. And so this sort of is like your user space scheduler for your coroutines. And so you get the event loop, and then you can stick something into the event loop. So you create a task in this particular one, we're gonna call it startup. And then we say to the loop, hey, run, and just keep running. And so it's exactly like a giant while loop. If you happen to end, okay, we'll close you. And so starting up, this is what we're gonna do. We're basically gonna create a server on this loop, and every time there's an incoming connection, factory will be this factory method will be used in order to create what we need. And so this is really what the inputs or what things are going to look like from this particular example that I have in the um, GitHub uh, examples directory. Only one's coming in at a time.
nothing terribly exciting. Could look like all the other ones. Now, when we scale it up so that it can handle multiple incoming connections at any given time, and it can handle multiple clients talking to it, as you would expect, whatever happens, just it, it's happy. Okay, so here's what we have. And the code, like I said, is going to look remarkably simple or similar to the synchronous blocking code. And that's because really a wait is just an explicit way of saying, yep, we're going to be blocking. But you're saying, but I understand other things may be running kind of behind the scene. So, in other words, other coroutines can happily run. So, in this particular case, uh, this is going to be running whenever a connection uh, is um, achieved. And the first thing, only because this is the single client case, we just tell the server, no, we don't want any more client connections. Then what we're going to do is we're going to start reading, much exactly like the blocking thing, we're going to read up to 1,024 bytes. And we're going to keep reading until the other end closes the channel. And then we're just going to close our end of the channel. And that's what the writer.close is going to do. When you compare that with the multi-client synchronous, I think this is perhaps where it, it is much nicer because we don't have to start creating multiple threads. Um, we've done that all in that boilerplate. The event loop is going to keep track of all of these coroutines that need to be run for us. So in this case, we it's exactly the same, except we just don't tell the server <laughs> that we don't want to take any more connections. And so you can keep treating each of those as if it's a synchronous connection, a synchronous blocking connection. And whenever something is not running in the background, that event loop, if there is something, it's going to run it. So I did some crappy benchmarks, and they are in that uh, GitHub repository again. Um, and so I guess at this point in time, I don't know if we want to try a quick little guess. So what do you think the results are going to be? What's going to have the highest throughput? Are we going to have synchronous blocking, synchronous non-blocking, or asynchronous programming? So maybe I'll just pause for a couple of seconds while people can <laughs> throw it up and we can, maybe I'll just pop off this for a second so that I can see the... Uh, yeah, if you can't see that, Peter, we've got a couple people saying async so far. Yeah, okay. All async. All async. Well, you might have thought because I did it last, it was going to be the best. <laughs> so um, the answer is not async. Uh, async is clearly better than uh, sync blocking. Um, but sync non-blocking is going to be your fastest solution. And the answer there is just, if you think about it, it's fairly obvious. Um, really what you're dealing with is almost a direct line to the operating system. You've got fewer abstractions that you are dealing with. So, you know, while it shouldn't take a lot of processor time, some of these things can take a lot of processor time. So um, let me just walk you through the, the, the two sort of tables that I've got here. The top one, what I did for these crappy benchmarks, and, and, and it's a micro benchmark, it's not a great benchmark, and don't, don't take too much out of it, but uh, the general trend is useful from it. And so uh, I ran two tests, I used JMeter, it just happened. I, doesn't really matter. Um, and basically, with the first test plan, I had it spin up a thousand threads. So that means up to a thousand connections at a given time. And through each of those connections, it's going to send 2,000 messages. Um, Just a quick question here, Peter. Yep. So, um, so, uh, so the async has more overhead than the sync non block? Uh, this is throughput. So this is messages per second on average. So, um, 3,000 messages um, for the first, the, for the top line uh, through the async approach. The sync blocking was only managed to get throughput of 
sort of 1600 messages a second. And the non-blocking case was able to do, you know, eight and a half thousand. Um, now with the sync uh, or the async await, um, I have a thing in brackets. So as I said, Python is rather in love with abstractions and often doesn't seem to care about speed, which is sort of disappointing, but it is what it is. Um, and so the approach that I showed you in those examples and what sits in the example directory um, is what's going to generate something around the 3000 messages per second in that, in that top line. Um, and that's using a, uh, a reader stream or what is it read streamer uh, abstraction. If you use a slightly different approach, a uh, callback approach um, that is available, you can actually just about double the throughput, which is kind of getting it to the sync non blocking level of things. Now, these are not all apples and apple comparisons. I mean, it's just it's a, it's, that's why I call it a crappy benchmark. Um, but it really does show that the overhead for a lot of these things uh, really can affect stuff. So the reason sync blocking is fairly low on the throughput is because it's spinning up a thread on every new connection. Um, you know, as I said, we've got these two different versions between async and await. If you don't have to go through this abstraction that uh, Python provides, you can almost double your throughput uh, from the abstraction approach and sync non-blocking because it's, you know, as close down to the bare metal as you're basically going to get with Python or to the operating system. Um, that's where you can get the greatest speed. And this is also the oldest code. So it's going to be, you know, obviously uh, fairly well tuned as far as Python goes. And then for the bottom table, this is just sort of showing memory, just so you kind of get a feel for what's going on. Uh, the first number is the virtual memory use. So that's the amount that's potentially available, whereas uh, resident and shared is kind of equivalent to what's actually being used. So the big thing there is in red, where we've got, you know, the synchronous blocking case where, you know, we've got a thousand threads, we've got basically a two gigabyte commit um, for memory uh, that can be used just in this particular case because the example is small we're only sort of using 22 megabytes or so but it sort of shows this is this is the danger <laughs> you could end up requiring a fair amount of memory so if you're concerned about memory efficiency this is perhaps not the way to go um, and non-blocking again fewer abstractions that are going on so we're only sort of using maybe 15 megabytes and that doesn't really change depending on the number of connections because those connections are pretty much managed down at the operating system level and with async and await the memory will change depending on the number of connections simply because you have a bunch of coroutines um, they're all running in the same stack because when one gets paused all the information, all the stack gets gets saved with it. But as you get more connections, you can have more coroutines that are waiting to run. So it simply has a little bit more memory. Um, if you had very deeply nested uh, calls going on, obviously that memory could, or the, those stack traces and all that information could end up being quite significant. And as you have to copy it in and out every time, um, it may end up slowing things down. Hey Peter, we got another question. Certainly. So, what's the best situation for sync non-blocking to be used? Um, well, async non-blocking is sort of something, or async non-blocking. Was it async non-blocking or sync blocking? Sync blocking. Uh, so sync non-blocking. Sorry. Yeah, sync. Pardon me. Sync non-blocking. Um, because I I just wanted to make sure because async non-blocking doesn't really make sense just as long as we're all right because the idea here is you're using coroutines that are actually <laughs> suspending um, so when does it make sense to use the most i mean some of it's going to depend on what your message protocols are like because you have to if you have something where say you have a defined length message that is passed around um, or there's a very distinct amount of header that will 
very quick within a, a fixed block that will tell you how much more is to come. Um, sync block is always going to be faster. Um, and um, But the problem is, is when you're sitting there waiting to see if there is something, uh, you don't know necessarily ever whether you've got the full message. Um, and that can be more of a sort of a protocol design uh, and program design based on your protocol there. Um, in the end, I think I would say the, well, I, I'll go show you some more benchmarks after this slide, but I, I think the reality is, is you're kind of in the same ballpark with async await as you are with sync non-blocking, and it's just easier to deal with. Um, it's very explicit what the, what the program flow is. Um, and so I think I would probably tend to use async await, but if you're, if you're really concerned with speed, sync non-blocking because it's as low as you're gonna get as far as the primitives go, and it's probably gonna be the way to go. Is there another question that came in? Are we good? Okay, so let's move on. So as I said, um, some more benchmarks, and these ones are better IO benchmarks. Uh, this is done by a company called Tech Empower, um, links down there at the bottom of the slide, and they're fairly well known. And basically they get contributors that are providing all sorts of uh, different implementations, different languages, different frameworks. I think they have something on the order of 300 different frameworks, and they, you know, they have a number of different uh, benchmarks for them. It's sort of this JSON serialization, single query, multiple query. This one happens to be one called Fortunes. What it does isn't really important. I just sort of chose it because it really stratifies uh, the different products or the, the different offerings from uh, different languages and different frameworks. So the way they rank these is just simply the fastest one is 100%. In this case, it was, I guess it's throughput with something on the order of, you know, 702 a second. I assume it was per second. I've never actually even looked at what the exact units are. Um, it happens to be written in Rust. Rust also has async and await. Uh, the big difference is Rust is compiled um, and the way async and wait are implemented in Rust is actually extremely cool because the compiler has so much information about the memory, it knows exactly how to create an optimized state machine for what's gonna go on. And so it only has to allocate once and it can allocate it, it can allocate it at startup time if it wants. Um, the second fastest one that was provided, another Rust one is about 90% of the speed of this one. And so you're probably wondering where does Python figure into this since I'm talking about IO. And this is why I needed to show you. Um, here is the first entry for Python. So it's about 9% of the speed of the fastest one. Starlet, which you, I, I'm not sure whether, I, I think Black Sheep uses async and await the new ASGI interface for web servers. Um, Starlet definitely does. Uh, it's about 8%. Fast API, which is built on top of Starlet, uh, is about 7.5%. Um, so if you're really looking for IO performance, Python is not where it's at. Um, so, <laughs> we'll just keep with that. Um, some of the other big names that you may care about, I didn't show them on this, but uh, Flask, 3.7%, uh, Tornado, 3.1%, and Django, 1.9%. So, um, IO, Python, if you're really concerned with performance, this is probably ultimately not the place to look. So, does it matter? And for those of you who are familiar with Betteridge's law of headlines is anytime you see a headline with a question mark, you can immediately effectively answer it with no. <laughs> um, so, you know, it might is really the answer. Um, so if you're actually concerned about true efficiency and you're really worried about your throughput, um, you're not gonna wanna use Python and it's really not gonna matter. If you're doing a little bit of it, it's probably not a big deal. Um, hardware utilization isn't always 
the greatest and most important measure of efficiency. So, you know, I, I've talked to earlier about developer efficiency, you know, maintainability, these sort of things. If you got, if you're familiar with Python, do it in Python. That's not a big deal. Do you need a particular library? Do you, you know, that makes you want to use Python? Well, use Python. You have a legacy code base that you're putting this with? Use Python, whatever. Um, because in the end, it's probably about developer resources. Because if you've, if you've implemented something that's IO based uh, generally pretty well, you can scale it. You can throw more servers at it. They're not terribly expensive uh, at this point in time. Um, so, for instance, you know, in the you know in the previous case where you know maybe you're getting eight percent of whatever the ultra tuned Rust version can do. Um, well, throw ten servers at it, and you're probably going to be in the same kind of ballpark. You know, maybe you need twelve, maybe you need fourteen. Um, maybe at that point it starts to become a big deal. Um, maybe not. Uh, alternatively, you might vertically scale, which would imply, okay, we'll throw more horsepower at it. What if you threw double the processors um, or double the processor power at it? Maybe that's going to solve your problem. So um, that was really all I wanted to talk about this evening. Um, I just hope that sort of gave you guys a sort of a different perspective on I/O, um, and you know, in the sense that processor bound is actually IO bound really. Um, and you made you sort of at least touchingly familiar with uh, some of the common idioms, the synchronous blocking, the non-blocking, and the asynchronous programming approaches. Different languages do it differently, but the async and await seems to be kind of standardizing across libraries, at least the way it's, or pardon me, languages about how it's working. Um, some some libraries for you to look at, as I mentioned uh, when we were talking earlier about the uh, the global uh, interpreter lock. If you want to do rather than multi-threading, you don't want to use the. If you're going to do multi-threading, so everything operating in the same process space, you're going to use threading. If you want to start talking about different processes, different address spaces, um, you're going to start to look into multi-processing. And there's async IO. There's lots of peps around if you want to look at some of the history for async IO, uh, the tech empower uh, framework benchmarks are there. Uh, Node.js, Nginx, <laughs> what is better, just law of headlines. Uh, and if you want to reach me at any point, feel free. Um, there's plenty of contact details. And as I mentioned, several times and posted, uh, hopefully people saw it in the chat. There is the link, uh, PH balance is the, is my user handle at GitHub and you can, I don't have an awful lot of repos, so you can sort of crawl your way through there and the worst case and find the uh, talk. Um, I think there might be a few very small changes that I'll upload to the slide deck, but the examples and the benchmarks you should be able to run on. I, I ran them Python 369, you should be able to run them. Thanks very much. Thanks, Peter. That's a really wonderful talk. So actually, uh, in addition to your last comment there, does it matter? Um, it, to be honest, it doesn't really matter for like 99% of the business because in fact, the blocking part is actually the database or the actual IOs of the system. So in terms of socket IO, uh, most of the frameworks can do the job. So for example, Django has been used for many, many big companies and they have no problem until their active users reaches what, like, I can recall a billion. So, uh, well, yeah, it, it, it's really great to see uh, if there's a benchmark to compare, you know, the Python IO with actual database uh, read and writes versus like, let's say, I don't know, Rust. So then it'll be, um, it'll, it'll be much I believe there is one, but I mean, some of that is going to matter yeah. how, you know, if, if your database access takes you 10 minutes, <laughs> yeah. let's just, you know, just to pull it a ridiculously large number out. Um, if you are, um, uh, if you have uh, this rather large, uh, time, you might care more about how many uh, users can you have connected at any given time. 
Yeah, now, exactly. <laughs> um, and so that might be a different thing. But you, as I said before, you can horizontally scale, you can vertically scale. Now, you know, I've been working with a company that does, you know, a billion API transactions in a day. Their stuff is actually written in Python. <laughs> yep, <laughs> they just that's... they just scale it out really big. That's what I meant. <laughs> you know, and, and you can do that. But, um, you know, maybe if you didn't have, you know, it, if your development team wasn't particularly strong in Python, it might not be the place to start for an IO bound application. Unless you had other needs. So you have a particular library you need to use. Okay, go ahead. You can do it. <laughs> Just don't yeah. expect the best performance. Totally. Uh, so another question I have is, would you mind sharing some experience on debugging on async? <laughs> uh, in Python, I find it rather revolting. Um, I, so you, you really do need good support for being able to give you a trace back on what's going on. Um, so for instance, uh, like Tornado uh, has had the concept of uh, coroutines for quite a while and their trace backing you know, is quite fine and you can actually get you know, a very reasonable backtrace as to what's going on. Now you end up, you can end up with a lot of sort of, you know, await calls in there and sort of some extra stuff that you might not recognize, but it usually doesn't take too long to filter it out and you, you start to recognize it as, oh, this is just a, this looks extremely, if not exactly the same as a, as a typical stack backtrace that you would get. Um, you know, with anything, you need to be careful about blocking when you're doing something like that, but you need, you need to be careful anytime. So if you're printing out error messages, well, if you're using standard out, you need to make sure that that standard out is a, a non-blocking or a, a buffered uh, solution so that it's going on behind the scenes and it's not, you know, causing big problems. But, uh, you know, in most cases, if, if you have, you know, a type error or, you know, some kind of a runtime error that you haven't caught, the backtrace should look remotely similar that you'd be able to very much figure out, okay, this called this, called this, called this, called this. That makes sense? Yeah, cool, thanks. Uh, is there any, do we have more questions? I think most people have nodded off to sleep already. <laughs> <laughs> All right, seems like that's it. Well, thanks a lot for the wonderful talk and uh, thank you Ben for the talk as well. It's, uh, it's really nice to have you uh, have both of the very informative talks. So uh, thank you both. Um, our next Python meetup is June 24th. So please mark the calendar. And um, if you would like to participate in the draw, please stay, I will share my screen for a draw real soon. All right, thank you all. Have a great evening and I'll see you all next time.